Praise the Lord. Well, I guess that means Steve Gabriel's going to sing when he comes to preach for me this year. I got the memo. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What an incredible thing we're a part of. Can you say amen? What a miracle. And it's been a great conference. It's always a great honor to preach at conference, and we'll believe God to help us. Amen. Matthew chapter 21, if you'll turn with me. World Evangelism Night. Hallelujah. The spirit of classic illustrations that are worth repeating, this, this one seemed fitting. There's the story of the two brothers that had terrorized their small town for decades. And the younger brother died unexpectedly. The surviving brother went to the pastor of the local church and said, I'd like you to conduct my brother's funeral, but it's very important to me that during the service, you tell everyone my brother was a saint. The pastor said, but your brother was no such thing. The wealthy brother pulled out his checkbook, said, Rev, I'm prepared to make a $500,000 contribution to your church. And all I require is that you publicly state that my brother was a saint. The pastor thought, said, okay, snatched the check, <laughs> cashed it. <laughs> and at the funeral, the pastor began, everyone here knows that the deceased was a wicked man. A whoremonger and a drunk. He terrorized his employees. He cheated everyone he could. And then he added, but as evil and as sinful as he was, pointed to the living brother, compared to his older brother, he was a saint. <laughs> I was reminded of that story when I was pondering this message. And I want to preach a very simple message tonight that I've called the better brother. Matthew 21. Let's read verse 28 through 31 together. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it and went. And then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. The better brother. I want to look first of all at not missing the moment. Like many generations, the people in our text would have had no idea how spiritually charged this moment was. If you take an overview of chapter 21... There's a very valuable context here. Verses 1 through 9, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, he is being proclaimed as Messiah, and he was fulfilling Daniel's prophecy that was made 600 years before. It's interesting that unlike Christ's second coming, Daniel literally set a date for Christ's first coming. You can see this in Daniel 9, 24 through 26. Daniel predicted that from the command to rebuild the temple till Messiah came, scholars have calculated his figure of speech, it came to exactly 173,880 days. And in our text, Jesus arrived to the day that was predicted 600 years before. This was a huge moment. And in verse 9, it clearly indicates that he was being received as Messiah. So this was a powerful moment. If you look at the rest of chapter 21, the cult, the money changers, Jesus is answering the critics. He curses the fig tree. He's his authority is being questioned. There's parables. Chapter 21 quotes or draws from no less than seven Old Testament scriptures and mentions four prophecies being fulfilled. 
So think about this in an overview. Since the moment mankind fell in the garden and the plan of God for redemption was promised, now thousands of years later, the very purpose of God is reaching a crescendo moment. And the people here are in danger of missing this. You know, the truth is, there are still moments like this being written in time. And in the timeline of heaven, we're still a part of God's plan. These moments still exist. We are a people of prophecy. We are fulfilling prophecy. And we experience our own spiritually charged moments. You know, it's been said conference is life-changing because it's so spiritually charged. We understand that, but have you ever tried to explain that to somebody? You know, like at work? You know, you've put in for the week off, and you come to conference, and you return, and you go, man, that was incredible. That was incredible, really. What did you do? What was it about? Oh, you should have been there. We spent Monday through Friday listening to 17 sermons in a tent in the winter. And they got heaters this year. Sometimes they use them. It's amazing. And they look at you like, are you out of your mind? And the momentum builds. Isn't it amazing how the momentum builds throughout the week? Thursday, Friday, simply because what is it about Thursday and Friday? I want to tell you it has nothing to do with the personalities on the stage. It is the fact that we are continuing to participate in this spiritually charged reality that was every bit as real and powerful in our text as it is today. And that is God's prophetic pur purpose, which is the harvest. The theme, if you look at this chapter again in an overview, it is about fruit. In verse 19, Jesus expected fruit. Verses 28 through 31, our parable is about working in the harvest. Verse 33 through 40, it's another about fruit and harvest. And the same Messiah that chose them has chosen us. What a miracle. To bring forth fruit. And you know that one of the keys to life is not missing the moment. I want to look secondly at amazing grace. Because in our text and what we're focusing on is in this exchange that's taking place, Jesus is Responding to some cynical questions, he returns some questions of his own. And then right here where we're reading, he tells a story about a father who owned a vineyard. He told his sons to go work in it. The first son said no. No. And then later regretted it and went. The second son, yes, sir but he never did get around to obeying. And verse 31 and 32 explains that it was the sinners of that generation that were the first son in the parable. The sinners. You know, sinners overtly refuse. They just say no. They say no to conscience. They say no to people witnessing to them. They say no to the voice of God. It points out very clearly that they overtly refused but then later repented and went. Verse 23 tells us that it was the chief priests and the elders that Jesus was having this brain wrestle with. And they are the second son in the parable. Outwardly, they were saying yes, but they did not obey. Barclay says, this parable teaches us that promises can never take the place of performance. 
Fine words are never a substitute for fine deeds. The son who said he would go and did not had all the outward marks of courtesy. In his answer, he called his father, sir, with all respect. But a courtesy which never gets beyond words is a totally illusory thing. True courtesy is obedience, willingly and graciously given. You know, as you pastor, you, you run into various versions of this. This can be very disorienting. You know, on one hand, you have the first type of rebel, overt, contrarian, disobedience, very dis- difficult, very disruptive. But on the other hand, the second type has a different feel to it. How many of you pastors know what I'm talking about? These, this, is the, this is the type that's very polite. Very, how should we say, proper, almost cordial. And their, their, their demeanor is one that would give you the idea that they are on board. But in reality, you find out that this is a different kind of rebellion. I call it passive rebellion. Because outwardly, people agree, they attend. There's a lot of people that affiliate, but fundamentally do not obey. And always, always have explanations, always have the accommodating theologies. This is exactly what Jesus is dealing with. And it's no different in our generation. Barclay says this parable is not really praising anyone. It is setting before us a picture of two very imperfect sets of people. Of whom one set were nonetheless better than the other. Neither brother was the model child. The model child who having been told what to do immediately did it cheerfully as it should... We could actually call this parable the parable of the better brother. Because to God, both were annoying. (laughs) But the first was better. And you know what the application of this is, truthfully? Every person here, every person on earth is one of these two brothers. Every person in the tent, every one of us, is one of these two brothers. And let's be honest, we have all been the first brother at one time or another. Amen? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We do believe that here. And... In one sense, this parable is, is quite unnerving, if you're honest. Because if you, just, if you just so happen to be the second brother, woe. Woe be to the professing saint. The professing saint that's not obeying their father. Now that does not mean that everybody needs to go on the mission field tonight. It does not mean that everyone is called to be a pastor, but it does mean that everyone is called to be united and helping in the harvest. Because we have all been told by our Father, go to work in the harvest. And so as as we take an honest look at this, we have to do some inventory. Woe to the couple that is called and mouths world evangelism, but won't go. Woe be to the pastor that mouths the fellowship, but unwilling to reproduce the fellowship model. Or woe to the person in the local church that sings, for he is Lord, but can't bring themselves to be committed enough to just fulfill the ministry that God has called them to in that local body to facilitate those that are called to go. 
And so it's unnerving. But in another sense, it can be very encouraging. Because that means that if we locate ourselves as the first son that is overtly saying no to God, we can repent. Can you say amen? Or if we can locate ourselves as being the second son who has learned to go through the motions and yet has not complied in obedience, we could repent there as well. But we have to be ready to admit we owe it to our Father to obey Him. And the minute we reconcile that, there's hope for our destiny. Think about this. Verse 29, verse 32. As a summation of this, I will not, but afterward he regretted it and went. Verse 32 and verse 31. I say to you that Tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not after repent. Think about this. To God, sinners who really get saved and reluctant laborers that finally obey are synonymous. Think about how God responded to you as a sinner and you got saved. You could feel the acceptance of God. You could feel the forgiveness. I, I know I could. And in our parable, Jesus is saying that that is synonymous to a son who having been reluctant, finally says, God, I will do what you want me to do. That same acceptance and forgiveness and grace and blessing is extended. The issue of this parable is, is stewarding our involvement. And then right after that, he tells another parable about stewarding the resources that he has placed into our hands. And I believe the exact same dynamic kicks in right there. As God begins to prosper ministries, that isn't just so that we can go full-time and quit our jobs. Thank God we need to do that. Can you say amen? That is a very important step. That isn't just so that we can relieve the mother church of the burden of support. And we need to do that. We need to be thinking that way. That is a dignity. Can you say amen? But as God begins to prosper and, and bring people and bring resources and, and dominion, there is a stewarding in light of the willingness to direct all of the above into the effort of world evangelism. And the question is, which son are you? Which son am I? At whatever level you're at, whatever, whatever amount of precious human beings that God has released to your ministry, whatever level of, of financial resource, he goes right to the next Parable, and this parable now is about bearing fruit, surrendering the fruit, and remembering that everything that has been placed at our disposal is to be viewed as a stewardship for the harvest. And we can get this done tonight. It's very simple. We either recognize that we have been openly rebellious. And, and I, I know that sounds really, really serious and really dastardly, doesn't it? But I, I, love, I love the transparency of our missionaries as they begin to talk about the struggles that they went through to answer the call to become a missionary. And maybe that's not true for everybody, but it's not 
an unusual experience. It's not an unusual reality that, that here we are, and, and since our conversion, we've been moved by world evangelism. We give to world evangelism, but it is not an unnatural experience that when God puts the tap on somebody and says, I want you to unlock, and I want you to obey, that there's something in the flesh that can rise up. And I know that was true for me. And I'm, 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 I'm refreshed to hear that some of my heroes, as they talk about the struggles that they had when they first came to terms with a definite call. So when we say openly rebellious, look, we're not, we're not tra- talking about people that are sliming through the church, drooling and just, you know, half blaspheming. We're talking about human beings just like you and I. And probably the appropriate question would be, is it I? So we can get this done. So it is either coming to terms with God, there's something about my flesh and my will that's in the way and surrender to that. Or we come to terms with the fact that while we have perhaps embraced a portion of the pattern or a portion of the goal that that we're lacking, that that something about our posture and our stewardship is not quite tracking with this. We're saying, go into all the world, but we're we're not completely ticking all these boxes. The good news is we can repent. And with God, that's good enough. In other words, God has, has no delusions about what he, the, the kind of material he's working with. He's quite happy to deal with the flawed material of, of fallen human nature surrendered to the blood of Jesus. I'm telling you, this is an amazing grace. If you just stop and think about what God has made us a part of, for all our flaws, for all our failures, we are allowed to participate in the greatest enterprise in time or eternity. And this is what Paul was referring to in 1 Thessalonians 2 when he says, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. I'm going to look thirdly then with gaining the kingdom. We've heard this week uh, from Pastor and and from other references how the Perth Church in 2009 required that Pastor Mitchell came and rescued the church. And the church had suffered under a pastor who had violated these principles in many ways. um, Presenting itself as being on track with the fellowship vision, but, but in reality, not at all, and very much the opposite. And so Pastor Mitchell came and uh, rekindled the vision And I had the privilege of going in after six months and literally just was able to ride the wave and begin to uh, see a miracle in that congregation. There's a testimony that I want to share with you out of my experience there. After after being there a couple years, there's a a young man in the church. His name was Zach Triono. And Zach came to me and... I hardly knew him because he was so low profile. He was just, he was just, just by choice, very low profile, just a, a little guy. He was from Indonesia. He had married the missionary's daughter and found a way to immigrate to Australia. You know, that, for third world men, that is a dream come true. <laughs> he, he did it. He, he, he found his way, and he's in there. And he, he even eventually became a citizen of Australia, which means he gave up his... Indonesian citizenship, and I don't think he shed too many tears over that. He was quite comfortable. He was just a good guy, very low-key, 
Turns out he was a very talented guitar player, but I didn't know that because he wasn't involved in any ministry. He used to come, sit off on the side, hardly knew him, really. And one day, after I had been there for a couple years, I think, he came to me, and pastor, he said, you know you preached on the two sons, and it was a sermon out out of the same text. He said, you know you preached on the two sons. And I said, yeah. He says, I got to tell you something, Pastor. I'm the first son. He says, I am called to Indonesia. And I have been saying no for years. And he, and he said, I just want to, I want to repent. What do I do? I said, just repent. <laughs> Get involved. And he threw the switch he, began, he got in a band. I was floored. The guy's an amazing musician. Got in a band for a while. He got into a Bible study, was a Bible study leader for a while. Became my follow-up director. And almost two years to the day that he surrendered, there was an emergency in Jakarta. And I had to, I had to make a fast decision to replace a missionary. And he was able to respond. And Zach and Zoe went in. He's been there for three years, and this man has been transformed. It is one of the most delightful things to watch. Here, he, he's, he's, he's grown the church. They're in a new building. He has been able to keep the old guard disciples that were there and win them to himself, but he has a whole stable of young disciples that are coming up, and and he has one male new convert from a neighboring island called Nias. I'd never heard of this island. I, I don't think anyone would hear of this unless you're a surfer. I think it's got like good surfing or something. But it's just this little island out there in that chain. And this convert of, of Zach Triono went home and gave his testimony and electrified the island. This young man said, called back, said, Pastor, you got to plant a church here. Pastor, we got to do something here. I'm getting asked to speak in churches. I'm just a new convert. And so Zach organized an impact team. And he led that impact team to the island of Nias on December 26, just passed. Made powerful impact. And just in a week, turned that island nation upside down and now, Zach Triono is not only rejoicing that he finally obeyed and went, he is now thinking world evangelism. He is plotting to plant a church in Nias. Hallelujah. <laughs> Verse 31 and 32. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that the tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. See, this is more than just going to heaven. This is more than someday you're going to make heaven. We're talking about entering the kingdom of God. We're talking about entering a dimension, gaining the kingdom. And that begins now. Matthew 19, 29, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So beyond the material, dominion, anointing, fruitfulness, the blessing of God. The opportunity is time-sensitive. You know what's powerful about this, this chapter is you really begin to focus on, on the dynamics here. Israel did not have forever to steward this. Verse 40 and 41, as Jesus continues and talks about the vineyard and how they, they killed the servants and the son. And verse 40 says, And when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these vine dressers? And they said he will destroy both those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus goes on. And he says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and be given to a nation that will surrender the fruit. Yes. 
See, while this was a warning to the poser son and should be taken so, I really take encouragement and believe that this is encouraging to those that struggle. The fact that you and I battle the flesh, the fact that you and I have to struggle with weariness or struggle with with, um, attitude or struggle with obedience, that does not disqualify us. Who did the will of the Father? The first. You know, Zach Triono, I, I just checked up on this just before service and asked him, what kind of job did you have in Perth before you made your surrender? He said, oh, pastor, I had the dream government desk job. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A third world guy from Indonesia makes it to Australia, becomes a citizen, gets the dream government desk job. And the truth is, Zach had very little confidence in himself. He's not extremely articulate. He would, he would admit that. Was working with him as the follow-up director simultaneous to the outreach director. And, you know, Zach would struggle with altar calls. But he would come and say, Pastor, help me. I want to do this. And, and just, just surrender to God. And you know, God filled in the blanks. God brought the equipping. God brought the the confidence and the strength and the ability that is not in ourselves. And today, I, I am thrilled. Here he is a missionary leading a team of disciples to an island nation. And as I was tallying the reports as he was texting me, Miracles, deaf ears, vision restored, injury, pain, not only himself but his disciples praying on the street, on the beaches, crusades with hundreds of visitors at the end of one week, 290 plus decisions for Christ. (laughs) Hallelujah. Because a reluctant son repented and went. His closing text to me said, The harvest is ripe in Neos. Thank you for your prayers, Pastor. It is a privilege. Jesus is giving us the opportunity as imperfect people to enter into massive privilege. The challenge is to lay aside past failures, lay aside weakness, imperfection, to be the better brother. That's all we're called to be, is the better brother or the better sister. And what's amazing and what's encouraging, if you look in the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 11, the roll call of faith, these people are remembered for their decisions of faith. Thank God the record of Hebrews 11 edited out the weaknesses. David had his ups and downs. His life is summed up. It says he served his generation by the will of God. One of my pastors, Steve Lassie, right before I came, said, Pastor, you remember your sermon you preached years ago called 50 Feet from Revival. He said, here's another illustration for you that's similar to to what you said in that sermon. And this has to do with an experience he had as a a man that's involved in the mines in WA. In 1904, this isn't involving him yet, in a remote area of WA, they discovered gold, mostly gold dust, and it was very, very modest, the amount of grams per ton of ore. They closed the mine in 1938, due to the Depression, World War II looming, and it remained inactive until the early 2000s, and they hoped the mine would be viable, and they reopened it, and shortly after that, they hit this huge vein. And it wasn't gold dust. This was visible alluvial gold, is what he called it. They hired Steve Lassie in 2006. So as part of the orientation, they took him on a tour 
Imagine, they showed him the old vertical shaft where they used to uh, sift this gold dust from by hand. And then they showed him the new dig where they hit the big one. It was five feet to the right of this old mine shaft that they gave up on. And instead of a modest 8 to 30 grams of gold per ton, this new vein was hitting 438 grams per ton. Unspeakable treasure. He said, Pastor, literally meters from the mother load. That's Steve Lassie's contribution to this sermon. You could be meters from the mother load. Listen. God loves us even in our failures. God loves us even in our, our chapters of weakness. You may be tired, you may be hesitant, you may be reluctant, but you still are not far from the kingdom of God. We are often just one good decision from hitting the jackpot. Be willing to obey. For some, obey means you're going to go. Others, to obey means you're going to stay. For all, it means we're going to labor, we're going to give. Can you say amen? amen? But verse 31 reminds us, who did the will of God? He said the first. The first. The son who didn't always bat a thousand. The son who wasn't always in the right frame of mind or heart. We have an amazing opportunity to strike gold and all we have to do is be the better brother we don't have to be perfect and more often than not the altar of surrender church is just meters from the mother loan i'd like every head bowed every eye closed